Hi, I'm Don Engel. I'm from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC. I'm giving a talk on our visualization research and facilities. Um, and I'm going to divide the talk today into first just an introduction of myself because I have a couple of different hats and I want to explain why I'm here and what I hope to get out of the opportunity I have to present to you and hopefully the opportunity you have to hear this talk. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the institution just to give you a overview of who we are because you might not know. And then I'm going to talk about simultaneously our research and our facilities. A lot of what we're doing that I think is particularly exciting, especially for an external audience who we might maybe be able to partner with, um, is related to our unique hardware and corresponding software that we've set up, um, both because you could come to our university and use it with us, or because um, you could replicate things we've done and we could learn from things you've done in improving what we have. Uh, most of what we're building, we mean to be building in such a way that others can reproduce it. So with no further ado, introduction of myself. I am Don Engel. I serve as UMBC's Assistant Vice President for Research. And through that role, I lead our Office of Research Development, which is the part of the research leadership team that is working on building collaborations, helping faculty find external and internal partners. Uh, we manage our internal seed funding. Um, to a certain extent, we manage our shared research infrastructure, our core facilities. And, um, and we help faculty think about where they might apply for funds also. And some of our funds come from NOAA, for which we're very grateful, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I also have a 20% appointment by salary with the Division of Information Technology. A lot of that relates to my data science work. That is um, in large part tied to my work with our visualization facilities, but also relates to my work with our high performance computing research facilities. So I'll talk about all of that and how it relates as well. I am a professor too. I have an affiliate appointment because my primary appointment is the leadership role. I have affiliate appointments in three departments, each of our colleges, Department of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering, Department of Physics, and the Imaging Research Center. So in the Venn diagram of things that people know in those disciplines, I'm the intersection, not the union. I'm just that little area in the middle of overlap maybe between all of those things as a specialist. Um, I lead a research group, that research group, which I call the, um, the Assistive Visualization and Artificial Intelligence Lab um, is the Venn diagram again of these three units. It is best understood as a lab that is a lab of each of these entities because I am part of each of these entities. There are seven students and one full-time research staff person working with me in the lab, um, but we are working as we are improving on our facilities and as we are doing projects of interest with faculty and students from across the university and lots of external collaborators. So we'll talk about the projects in a moment. I want to make sure you know about UMBC. We are um, the, by most measures, the third largest doctoral university in Maryland, but the largest, Hopkins, is larger by a factor of two in research dollars than the second runner-up nationally. So we're much smaller than the first two. The other one is College Park, which is the flagship of the university system of which we're a part. We're a separate university in the system. Um, we are, um, and this first one is per capita. It's the only per capita rank that I want to mention. We're 17 nationally and 48 globally for citations per faculty member. So our, our researchers are producing impactful work at high volume. Um, we're number nine in most innovative schools in US News and World Reports. Um, we are number eight in best undergraduate teaching. Almost, well, many of our undergraduates are engaged in research. We have a lot of internal programs to make sure they're getting involved in research, although we also have extensive master's and PhD programs. Um, and perhaps most surprisingly, I don't know, because we have a good reputation for those things, we are 12th nationally, not per capita, for NASA funding. And we've been in the top 20 higher and lower than 12th for, for years. This is as of the most recent NSF herd survey, which is fiscal year 19. And I want to highlight, since I'm speaking predominantly to a NOAA audience, that most of that, or a large fraction of that, is um, atmospheric uh, science research, is Earth systems research. And a good chunk of, of the total of our, Na our, our NASA dollars come from our cooperative research centers that we have housed at Goddard. Outside of those activities, the NASA research centers, which are research faculty who have affiliate appointments but are mostly in these centers, the largest 
set of fields that we have as a sort of describable unit are our information science and data science disciplines. Now, this is important to note as we're considering the relationship between NOAA and UMBC and what I think our relationship could be. We're only um, about 28 miles away from NOAA, UMBC, NOAA, in Silver Spring. Um, half hour, if you take the more direct route, and time it well. So it's not hard to get between our two campuses. Um, and we're doing a lot with NOAA's support already. These are a, a subset of the awards that UMBC was funded under from NOAA in just fiscal year 19. Uh, two of them are cooperative agreement centers that are multi-university and UMBC is a part of them. The rest are um, more traditional grants. Um, but most of them have a um, um, atmospheric component that is supporting and collaborating with atmospheric scientists. Some of it is aquaculture. So I mentioned that UMBC is um, about 30 miles from NOAA. That's true insofar as our main campus. Uh, if you've ever been to downtown Baltimore, you may have seen this beautiful campus with this canvas roof, beautiful building with this canvas roof, oops, um, which is the Columbus Center that's managed uh, by UMBC. It houses UMBC and other researchers. The image that was below that is a large fish tank in our aquaculture research facility. We have an extensive uh, um, set of research activities happening there on closing the reproductive cycle of fish and other aquaculture research. None of those things that are funded by NOAA are heavily data science or visualization oriented, and yet we are doing a lot in those spaces, and NOAA is too. Um, the project which really led me to have the opportunity to be here today is our work with the magic planet that we have. We acquired it. It's four feet in diameter, but it's in the background. What you see in the foreground here are some students, and I'll talk about their project in a moment. But we acquired this magic planet, this spherical display, um, for the purposes of, of teaching in our geography and environmental systems department. Uh, but more recently, we've taken an interest in what else we can do with it. And we have an internal funding mechanism, again, to help our undergraduates be as involved in research as our master's and PhD students are, um, called CoLab, which that particular opportunity is to bring an interdisciplinary set of students to work together in a faculty-mentored way through a summer um, on some scientific storytelling or other interdisciplinary projects. So these students working with Ben Daniels, who's in the photo, and Nicole Trenholm, who you'll see in a future slide, um, created a spherical video um, with the intent that it be distributed ultimately um, on science on a sphere, which gave us the opportunity to present their work here at the Science on a Sphere Center at uh, Silver Spring Campus of NOAA. So there's... Uh, There's Ben again and Nicole and the four students who worked with them. Nicole um, has uh, an interest in, in extending this work further. Nicole goes on expeditions on ships into straits in the Arctic and will be capturing spherical video um, this summer to show the, the terrain, the changes in the terrain, and we'll use that content for future content production. So in creating this content, we actually had to entirely replace the software that came with Magic Planet, which um, slices videos up into single images and then shows them, roughly speaking, as a slideshow. We wanted to be able to just take a video and play it directly as a video file on the sphere. Um, and we've created, released, and now published in an academic conference. So this work is it's going to be presented at the IEEE VIZ, the IEEE's Visualization Conference, in a month or two. Um, but the, um, the code is now open source. And our hope is to make it so that not only can things less than a science on a sphere, like the magic planet, be more democratized, allow for people to more easily create content and download science on a sphere content and install it, that also we can just tweak our software and continue to release it in an open way, a uh, free way, a modifiable way, so that people can build their own desktop spherical systems. And there's some plans for those online that you can find um, using micro projectors and just the little covers that go over a light bulb that you can buy in a hardware store, the right arrangement of a lens and something 3D printed. You can make your own little um, spherical display for a couple hundred dollars or less. Uh, so we want to be modifying our software so it will work for a wide range of viewing modalities, including Magic Planet, which we've already done, 
other spherical displays, and also, as you'll see later, we do a lot with wall-based VR, head-mounted VR. So we're interested in making it easier to um, consume Science on a Sphere content, produce Science on a Sphere content, spherical content generally in other viewing modalities. Uh, there's a lot of underlying technical challenges. I won't get too deep on it, but I'll mention that they were addressed and solved in case anyone wants to contact me to discuss them further. We're taking, this is an equa rectangular projection, and we're converting it into an azimuthal projection where you have the North Pole at the middle, the South Pole at the outside, but it's trickier than that because in the arrangement of the magic planet, which we've sort of exposed here, normally there's a lot of apparatus around it, there's a projector going through a fisheye lens into a sphere that's lighting from the inside. It isn't an equa, equiangular azimuthal projection, which is to say that the lines of latitude aren't evenly distributed across the, um, the circle as you move out. Um, it's a nonlinear distribution. So we had to reverse engineer that and figure it all out. The other thing that we created with our interface is the ability to take just a uh, regular sort of PowerPoint remote and control the sphere with, with only that provided that you have a computer tucked away somewhere driving it. And it will automatically look for a folder that has whatever content you want in it that it can read, image files, movie files, and it will display it on the surface of the sphere so you can just control it directly from the sphere. Another facility that we have, which is less obviously connected to NOAA, but I will tie it in, I promise, is our photogrammetry facility. This was supported by a National Science Foundation major research instrumentation grant. You can see the facility here. Um, it's a configuration of 96, I believe right now, cameras that are all wired and to fire simultaneously. So you end up with um, many different perspectives of the same image. Uh, until recently, we've been using commercial off-the-shelf software to process those images. The software that we were using, Agisoft PhotoScan, is used um, by the small community of people who do photogrammetry for creating 3D models for things like virtual reality or animation, um, but also by the GES community, which takes many photos over time from, say, a drone to map a scene in 3D from the air. Our cameras are repositionable, and the software pipeline is something that we're re-engineering now. We're working with the Meshroom suite, which is open source, and we're contributing to that project, um, hopefully heavily soon. Um, and one of our most exciting things that we're doing with this is that we're making it so that we can run the photogrammetric reconstructions, the process of taking all of these almost 100 photos and turning them into a, a 3D model. Um, we can run that on our high performance computing facility very quickly and maybe get a much better result because we can put much more computing power into it in a shorter time than what we currently get out of a single computer that's beefed up with a lot of GPUs, graphical processing units. The current process requires a couple of hours of an artist's time to touch it up afterwards. Even though you get sub-millimeter resolution on a good day with a good surface, there's areas that don't process as well, hair or things where the cameras just happen to not be able to get a good view, like in between your fingers where things might be occluded. Um, so I'm putting some of the text in these slides so that if anyone wants to download these slides later, you'll have it as a reference. I don't mean to read the slides to you, but I will say that we have, I think now 96 cameras, we have projectors which add contrast to a surface if the surface isn't um, interesting enough for a computer to automatically recognize features that it can turn into 3D points. If you have a very flat, very monochromatic surface, the projectors can add um, noise to make it easier to process into a 3D model. Um, yep. Flashes that go off together. Again, this is mostly for the person who wants to download the slides. It's a much more technical description. So we're taking these 3D models that we can capture instantaneously and after a couple of hours process into something useful uh, and using them in a variety of VR environments. So one of our VR environments, which we can use for things besides VR, is our wall. So we call it the pi squared. Technically, it's a partial cave two. Um, you may have seen a cave VR environment. These um, have existed for a few decades. And they are rear projected screens, usually a partial cube, missing maybe a wall or the floor or the ceiling. And you stand in the middle of the cube, and you have uh, 3D glasses of some sort that let you see what's on the wall in 3D. And your head position is tracked. So as you move, what the left eye and right eye receive is updated um, relative to your head position. And you get what we call parallax. Objects that are in the foreground appear to move relative to the background as your perspective changes. 
with the Cave 2 system, which is more competitive and has sort of different advantages and disadvantages compared to the head-mounted VR, um, we have the next generation of those rear-projected cubic, cuboid caves. Um, they're curved. It's actually a set of regular 3D LCD panels, uh, 24 of them. It's a grid, in our case, of four high and six wide. If we had a full cylinder, it would be more screens. Um, but because it's a gradual curve, if you have other users, you can have a really useful multi-user experience in VR. If you have a headset, it's very much a one-person experience. Sometimes you can do things through a network to combine headsets together, but really you're looking at avatars of other people. It really dampens your ability to have a deep, meaningful conversation about maybe some scientific data that you're immersed in. Um, by being able to stand next to each other in a wall like this, as opposed to a cave, the secondary users, the ones whose heads aren't the one that's being tracked, do see some distortion as the main user's perspective changes. But because the curvature is gradual instead of these sharp 90 degree curves, it's not nearly as disorienting. It's, it's much more useful for group VR experiences. But it's also useful for just high resolution, multi-person um, data explorations. So we were fortunate to host the governor of Maryland, and there's our university president, in reviewing various statistics about the university's um, computer science and data science programs. Um, so that's one of my favorite photos of our facility, but here it is in a more scientific visualization mode. This is a VR uh, visualization of fMRI data. So you're seeing color coding showing how the water is moving around in the brain. Uh, the user here, whose silhouette you can see, has VR glasses, which are really just the 3D movie theater glasses, where you have circularly polarized clockwise and counterclockwise for the left and right eye. The walls, um, rows of pixels are horizontally interlaced, which means one eye is seeing all of the odd rows, and the other eye is seeing all of the even rows of pixels when you have the glasses on. Um, and one of our glasses has these little spheres that stick out of the side, and we have these cameras on the top, the ART tracking system that's mentioned here, that's looking in infrared for these little balls that are very shiny in infrared, so it can track the 3D position of that user's head. Um, we're fortunate to have a very nice high-end network connection between this and our high-performance computing facility, which we're working on leveraging. And I should note that this system um, is built to a spec that was developed by the, um, by the EVL lab at the um, University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, they came up with the original Cave concept and the Cave 2 concept, and they licensed the Cave 2 uh, scheme um, with a, I think, um, a license that, that, a single license, an exclusive license, um, to Mectine, the company that, that, that assembled it for us. And since it was assembled for us, we've heavily re-architected it, and we've been working with Mectine on, on what we've done, um, informing them and learning a little bit from them about how to do it better. Um, we stepped away from some of the constraints that were built into it. We made it a single computer operating the entire wall, so now we can just run any software that's built to run 3D visualizations using what's called quad buffered stereo that would work on a single computer. We can now just say run full screen and it runs across the entire wall of 50 million pixels uh, as though it's a single computer because in fact under the hood it now is really a single computer. Um, making that happen for this many monitors was a technical feat. And we've adapted Unicave from the University of Wisconsin I believe um, which is a Unity um, variation, Unity plugin, uh, that allows uh, Unity to work in a cave. Unity is a game development engine that's used for research as well for creating VR environments. So here you can see one of our projects that we've done using Unity. This is Mark Mernan. He's the full-time research staff person I mentioned in the lab, and he also serves as UMBC's core facilities specialist for the photogrammetry facility, the wall, and a few other instruments. Um, you can see as the camera moves, the camera is being tracked in this view. It really looks like the wall. You can see the edges of the individual monitors there, but it really looks like the wall is just a window into this virtual world. So this is our RoboSim project. We're doing it in collaboration with other faculty from computer science and electrical engineering who work on robotics and artificial intelligence. And we've made it so that you can have a simulated robot 
which thinks it's a real robot. It's being driven through the network by uh, ROS, which is a robot operating system. It's the software that's used to drive real robots. And it's receiving data from the virtual robot's sensors in the same way that a real robot will be receiving data from the real version of those sensors. So we're able to train robots on scenes, and in particular on human-robot interaction, when the robot has actually never been physically set up in that scene or that environment. We're able to just have a simulated version of the robot do all of the learning and then transfer the learning to a real robot. And here you can see this is an avatar that was captured of Mark laying in the bed there using our photogrammetry facility. And as someone is interacting with the robot, if the robot turns around and looks at the person, we have the person rigged as a model so that they see the actual operator in the virtual reality moving around um, based on the scan that we did of the person beforehand. Another VR facility that we have is our observational VR room. These pictures barely do it justice. It's a very large space. We've been able to take advantage of the fact that the latest lighthouses, these things that help a VR headset, particularly the Vive headsets, know where they are in space. Uh, you can now have four, and we have ideas on how to make it more than four, cover a much larger area when you used to only be able to have two. So we have a very large room and two of the four walls in that very large room are green. So we're able to do green screen and have people, as you see, here's the actual scene of, this is a different Mark, Mark Jasinski. Um, he's doing things in virtual reality, and you can see him in the virtual reality in real time doing those things. Uh, now, we're applying that setup that we've created to a, a wide range of, of use cases. This is a project that we're doing in collaboration with Carissa Chi, a professor in our psychology department, where we've scanned our real dining hall. We've reproduced it um, in virtual reality. And we have um, users. Uh, you can see here, these are the Vive controllers. So this is the virtual scene. And the person has picked up food and put food on the plate. We have users go through the buffet and see what food they want to put on the plate. And this is the classic experiment in psychology uh, with food choice, um, where you can change the uh, arrangement of a buffet, and people make demonstrably different choices based on the arrangement or based on what caloric information is shared. Some states and localities are making policies based on that. Um, so what we're doing in that existing model of the buffet setup of psychology research projects is that we're comparing how people behave in VR to how they behave in the real environment. And when I say how they behave, I mean we're going deep. We've got FNIR on people's brains. We're looking at brain activity. We're looking at other biometrics. We're looking, of course, at their viewport, at what they can see at any given time as their biometrics are being recorded. And we're building all around this, all of the infrastructure to see what we can measure about people while they are consuming information, while they're consuming a visual scene and interacting with it. And it's my dream, as someone who's trained as a physics PhD, to see this applied to more work on, um, on physical science data, the sort of data that NOAA would have. Uh, another thing we're doing with head-mounted VR, thanks to the support of um, the company that makes an amazing software product called SciGlass, is we're looking at volumetric data. So when we do our photogrammetry scans, we have point clouds that we generate from the things that the cameras see from the outside of a thing. But those cameras that are wired together to all fire together that you saw earlier, they're just capturing the outside of me. They don't know anything about my liver, right? But when you take an fMRI or a CAT scan or an industrial CT scan, which is like a medical CAT scan, but it's of an object, usually smaller, um, or any number of other what I would call volumetric or voxel-based um, 3D scans, you're getting, instead of pixels, instead of little squares making up an image, you're getting a 3D grid of cubes, tiny cubes, where each cube has a value. It might be a density or a color or any number of values per cube. So um, SciGlass allows us to interact with that data, manually tag it, and interesting to us, we can have humans in the loop on machine learning. So humans can be interacting with volumetric or other 3D data and um, validate or flag things that then there's a cycle on um, for training a computer model that can then deal with a much larger volume of data of the same type. And I'm saying that in a very general way. The creators of SciGlass came from neuroscience, and a lot of the initial use cases for SciGlass are neuroscience. So one of the things that I think they've been most excited about in, in, in talking with us is seeing what other disciplines, what other domains we can develop interesting projects around. And I'm very excited about doing things like this in atmospheric, oceanographic, and other physical sciences. 
Um, we also have a looking glass. Our work in this is a little bit um, more um, early stage, but the looking glass is a, they call it a holographic display, the, the manufacturers or a light field display. What it really is under the hood is a regular screen, an LCD screen with regular pixels, and then a lenticular overlay. So that's the ridged plastic that you might have on a Cracker Jack box prize or the outside of a 7-Eleven cup um, that gives you either 3D or motion as you move it or if you put your head in just the right position. But what this gives us, because the pixels are so small and because it's able to be updated in real time, is the opportunity to have lots of different perspectives and you have full parallax, full ability to move your head horizontally, and each eye is getting its own image as you move that's correct for your head position with no head tracking. It's glasses free, it's tracking free, and you can have multiple users around it at the same time. What you can't tell from this little looping video is it's not very large, um, so getting a lot of people around it isn't, isn't plausible, and it's pretty low resolution, but it's highly interactive. So the, the, the hand that you see moving there, um, it's, it's been tightly integrated by a lot of developers into the uh, Magic Leap, uh, sorry, Leap Motion, the Leap Motion sensor, which you can move your hand over and it tracks your hand position. So this is a virtual hand that's mirroring out of camera a real person's hand. And as they're moving their hand by, in this case, the model, the 3D model of the heart, they're able to move a cutting plane, uh, something that's slicing away so you can see the middle of the data um, by the position of their hand. So um, in general, um, there's a lot of things that I hope might come from having given this talk. I hope that you have a better perspective on UMBC, selfishly, as the assistant vice president who's responsible in part for making sure people know what we are and who we, what we do. Um, I hope you might think about collaborating with as a university generally, but specifically on this slide, I'm just talking about my own lab's research interests. We're very interested in collaborating with anybody in creating application-specific um, publications or outputs that are for their domain. So I, because I have a sort of funny set of appointments, don't need to publish in my discipline. I would love to work with people and help them publish in their discipline. And they don't need to be at UMBC. I'd love to work with anybody, collaborate with anybody, and help them publish in their journals. But for us, what our journals are, to the extent that we care about doing something other than that, um, we're looking at IEEE VR, IEEE Viz, and SIGGRAPH. We were fortunate to publish in all three this year and present at all three. Um, ACM Group and ACM CSCW are conferences about uh, enabling group work, and I'm particularly interested there in scientific collaborations, scientific collaborations over large data, maybe with an assistive AI and visualization thrown into the mix. Um, there's some computer vision conferences that we're targeting slightly longer term with our work in photogrammetry. And um, in addition to collaborations, we're also interested in finding funding for our lab. Um, or for instrumentation, and sometimes we have collaborators who have the opportunity to ask for money to support undergraduates, but don't have an undergraduate lined up, and if they wanted to work with us, uh, and they had the opportunity to just fund an undergraduate by asking for a supplement on there, in this case, NSF grants, you can often just request an REU, Research Experience for Undergraduate Supplements, we are able to put undergraduates to excellent use in our lab. They're, they're having great educational experiences, and they're being highly productive. They're public. We had a freshman just finished his freshman year and has now published two papers already in, in competitive conferences with us. So um, we'd love to work with people. Uh, we'd love to just see our work adopted by other people. So please um, don't hesitate to be in touch. Come visit us at UMBC. We're just a half hour away from Silver Spring. Um, I say here, come visit us. And that's because we have some things like the wall that are the size of a room and we can't bring with us to Silver Spring or wherever you'd rather meet. But otherwise, we're also glad to come meet you or talk to you electronically. My contact information is there. And as far as the us, I have many people to thank. There's a lot of projects that I've touched on today and many more that I didn't insert into the slides because we have too many to say in a short talk. Um, the only project that really I can't claim any contribution to at all is the, um, the Buffet project, which is my colleagues also in the Imaging Research Center working with uh, Carissa Chi in psychology. But we've been involved in building the overall infrastructure. Um, Mark Mernan is the research staff person who's really made all of our facilities and visualization possible uh, in working with the rest of us, but he's the full-time facilities uh, specialist. Nicole and Ben are the PhD students who instigated and led the undergraduate project to create science on a sphere content over the summer that led to them coming to NOAA, that led to me being here today. Um, so thank you to Nicole and Ben. Uh, the students listed here are the undergraduates currently working with me, Trevor, Max, Caroline, Daniel, Sarah, Danilo, and Brendan.
Can't do anything without all of you. Thank you so much. And there's a lot of professors who are working in our facilities and collaborating with, with us on research. But uh, just to name a few, um, Libu, uh, Suzanne, Braunschweig, uh, Frank Ferraro, Jeff Halverson, and Cynthia Matuzic have played very heavy roles in the projects that I uh, had the opportunity to highlight today. I also need to thank our sponsors. Uh, we've had six NSF major research instrumentation awards, one to establish the pi squared, the partial cave two uh, visualization wall, uh, one to create the photogrammetry facility, uh, three to create our main high performance computing facility, and we have one which is awarded just now um, for creating a new facility for uh, GPUs, a GPU cluster. Uh, we are fortunate to have had an NSF CS10K award, the undergraduate research supplement of which has supported a lot of our work. Um, we have an NSF CCIIE award, which allowed us to upgrade our network, which enabled um, enough bandwidth between our visualization facilities and our high performance computing facility that hopefully someday we'll be driving things in real time from the high performance computing facility instead of from our local cluster, although the local clusters served us well. I'm excited about what that will enable. We've had uh, funding from the Herbowski Innovation Fund, from the UMBC Colab Interdisciplinary Grant Program, and in-kind support from InstaVisio, who are the makers of the SciGlass tool that I mentioned before. They've allowed us to work with their tools and given us a lot of their time. So thank you to them, thank you to the students, and thank you most of all to Noah for inviting me to give this talk today. <laughs>